I hate to break the fishing news up here, Amchuk, but I'd like to speak about the ice hockey. Congratulations. You're one of the 13 listeners of the Real Life Podcast. We just traded a migraine in for, like, an orgasm. You might want to mark that down. Yeah. You're yeah. Yep. Yep. All of my projects are on schedule until they're not. A member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. About as funny as we're going to get today. Episode 231 of the Real Life Podcast. I'm Tyler Remchuk, joined by Bag Milk, Jay, and Wanye. Thank you for, for downloading and liking and subscribing wherever you get your podcasts from. Before we really get into it, this podcast is brought to you by Oodle Noodle, Edmonton's number one noodle shop. And as we've been doing for the last few weeks, I'm going to throw it to someone on this podcast to give me their Oodle Noodle order. And today it's you, Wanye. What is your go-to Oodle Noodle order? Well, I've only ever had a few things on the menu because I know I have to eat it forever, so I didn't want to get tired of it. Okay. But by far, my favorite thing is the butter chicken. All right. There you go. If you're looking for something to eat tonight, this week, whenever, check out our friends at Oodle Noodle and Wani's recommendation, the butter chicken. Don't forget, you head in store. 10% of the proceeds are going to go to a local charity as well. Uh, MS Society, correct, Jay? MS Society, I believe for a few more days and then we are going to be announcing our new partner uh the shoebox ah there we go wow i uh i butchered that the shoebox project the shoebox so project we'll, video will be launching soon more details but uh yeah heavy charity doing great things heavy charity what's that mean well, just it's it's heavy subject uh, matter. It's oh. uh, in terms of what they support and the great things that they do. Right. So yeah, so we'll we'll uh, next pod we'll get a little bit more detail for you. We launched shot the video on Friday, so it should be coming out soon. So I always like to time things, you know. Episode- Professional producer, pro- content creators that we are. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, episode two thirty one of the podcast, and we're gonna have a special guest. I plugged it on the Nation Real Life Instagram earlier today. He goes by the King of Cheer. He is the professional fan. You would have seen him at Roger's Place. He's the guy who would stand up, stomp his feet, wave his hands, and throw 30 t-shirts into the crowd at once. Cameron Hughes is going to join us. And I don't know know how well-known of a fact it is that he's a professional fan. Because I think if you're just a casual Oilers fan at Roger's Place and you see this guy get up and start dancing and hyping up the crowd and leading cheers and all that... You'd be like, man, either A, that's some crazy Oilers fan, or B, that's just some OEG employee that they tell to go stand up and, and fire people up. But that's See, originally, his... your M Tech, I thought he was like a fan. I'm like, yeah. look at this guy going yeah. for it. All right. And I'm like, yeah. Woo, look at him. He's going in the stands. And they're like, where did he get all these shirts to give away? Who the hell wears 30 shirts as a fan? Yeah, I, I just have so many questions for this guy. We're going to peel back the curtain a little bit about his career. On his website for the book, there's a video of him warming up, doing like crossovers and all that, like getting hype. I want to know, like, what is his pre-show? Because it really is a show for him. What's his routine like? Like, is he stretching? Is he, you know, like a rock star? Is he pounding a couple shots back before he gets out there? I, I'm fascinated to know more about this guy's career. It started back in Ottawa, of all places, when he was just a fan at that point. And it's uh, it's gone from there. 26 years, I believe, he's been doing this on a full-time basis, which is insane. So we'll have wow. him joining us in about 20 minutes' time. Uh, I also wonder, too, like, Tyler, like, don't you think there's, like, days when he just doesn't want to do it, but he has to do it? Yeah. You know I mean, it's just like we're at the job to him. He's like, ah, I got to go out and fire up, you know, the Hurricanes fans or whatever. I also want to know, like, have teams ever sent him a weird request? Like, have they ever been like, hey, we really want you to do this specific thing? And has he been, had to be like, uh, no, I'm not. That's a little bit odd for me. Um, anyways, we'll get into this all with Cam later in the podcast. Uh, reverse retro jerseys, those came out. Before I get to that, a big oil country congratulations to one Dustin Johnson, who won the Masters in a historic record-setting fashion. As someone who had money on Dustin Johnson, shout out oh, to yeah. him for making my weekend a lot better. And uh, I, man, I cleaned it up at the Masters betting wise. I'm just going to say that right now. I nailed so many top five. I nailed two of the top five, four of the top 10, and had another two in the top 20. It was unbelievable. Uh, but, anyways, Dustin Johnson, uh, you know, Thanksgiving at the Gretzky House is going to be a little bit more interesting with DJ winning at Augusta. Uh, is there a family Thanksgiving you would rather go to than the now Wayne Gretzky featuring Dustin Johnson Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah, I'll tell you what, because yesterday I posted a clip on the nation social of Boris Mirnov dancing his brother at the blue line <laughs> and scoring probably the greatest goal of his career. And I would say, yeah, I want to be at the Bobo 
household for Thanksgiving where he just reminds his brother. Hold on. He danced around Dimitri Miranov in that clip? You betcha. I didn't know that. Oh, now. shit. Wow. He played for the Cavs? I didn't know that. So he danced his brother, and I would just like to hear him brag about it for, you know, even though that was two decades ago. Doesn't matter. What, a, what about the Thanksgiving table at the Sutter household in Viking, Alberta? Yep. Yeah, but I feel like to get to that table, you would also have to go and do like 10 solid hours of labor on the farm. And then they'd be like, all right, now it's dinner time. So I don't know if but I want to commit he, to the physical labor. Oh, but what about also the physical abuse at the dinner table? Because it'll break into a fight nine Thanksgivings out of 10. That's also fair. I also feel like they might freeze a good section of the farm and there'd be a good shinny game after. So the Sutter one gets a honorable mention, I suppose. I think it'd be interesting to be at the stall fat like Thanksgiving. Do you know what I mean? Where two of them have cup rings and then they just kind of like oh, cap them at the other ones. Poor Mark. And then the fourth one who didn't make the show. Yeah, Jared. He made Jared the stall. show. He just didn't make the show for very long. I don't uh, know why. I can't, I can't believe I'm shitting on, on a stall. I'm just a fourth stall brother. <laughs> like, what the guy has more there. talented and pinky than I do in my entire body. Uh, but yeah, Dustin Johnson winning the Masters. That is, uh, someone texted in today, and they're like, that his child with Polina is going to be the greatest athlete of all time in whatever family he or in whatever sport he chooses. Because I mean, with the Gretzky genes and with those Johnson genes, who there's two of them for fuck's sake. Yeah. What if he was just like he wanted to get an arts degree and draw caricatures on the boardwalk? You know, he'd be the best. He'd be the best at it. Mm-hmm. I think Dustin I'm, Johnson. I still. I, you, since you brought up Wayne Gretzky, I'm still having a hard time getting over that picture of him in the Drake hoodie. <laughs> oh, he looks so good, though. He looks unreal good. Like, he is on fire. Influencer marketing is legit because I kind of really want that hoodie. It's been sold out for ages. You can't get that hoodie for like, it's been unavailable for months and months. And months. Oh, so Gretzky is just next level cool because he has one. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, Most uh, OVO gear is like that. It's all he like looks that. good, though. Fuck, does he look good? He looks sharp, real sharp. It's the whole look. It's the jacket over the hoodie. The it's it's a great ensemble by the great one. Who? What is Dustin Johnson's background, Jay? Did he come from like a hard scrabble upbringing, or was he pretty normal? Was he a rich kid? What was he? I I don't know. I I know I know the school he went to wasn't like a known name school, like a known name, not a no name uh, school. Uh, that that much I know. I don't know too much about his 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 come up. Outside he, of the fact that he's just the most swagged out golfer there is. Oh fuck, ridiculous! I love oh. how uh, Janet was like saying goodbye to him in her Instagram. The last photo is him waving as he left in the morning. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Maybe he had a really weird family, and maybe now that the Gretzky, maybe that he's a Gretzky, they're like, here's how you mastermind this shit. Now he's unbelievable. I just like that I got to watch the Masters and feel like I too could play at the Masters, obviously a lot, when Tiger Woods hit a shot of 10 on the 12th hole. He, how about, though, how about he bounce back? Yeah. yeah. He was like five yeah. under after that or something Incredible. crazy. He, he shot a 10 and he still finished the back nine with like a 39, I think. Like, that's wild. It was amazing. Unbelievable. Um, but yeah, congrats to DJ. I like, I'm personally a fan of seeing like greatness rewarded. It's part of the reason I liked seeing the Dodgers win the World Series this year. I liked watching the Lightning win the Cup. I liked when Ovi got his ring. Like Dustin Johnson has had that reputation as a bit of a choke artist on majors. He's led four times heading into Sunday, and he's blown it all four times until and yesterday. Uh, but I like when a great player kind of gets their due. That feels good for me. As much as I love an underdog story, and it'll be the same thing when Connor gets his ring too. Granted, I'm an Oilers fan. I just want to see that to survive. Um, but like seeing great players do great things, I, that's all, that, I love seeing that. And that's why I loved watching him win the way he did. Anyway. Convincingly. Those first five holes, though, yeah. or four holes, I was like, oh, oh. It's hilarious. crazy that like, I remember when Tiger won the Masters and he was 19, he has a little red shirt on and he was doing it. They're like, this record will stand the test of time. It will never be broken. Because wasn't it, he like shattered the old record. Yeah. And then and there you are, DJ beat him. And didn't they change up the course pretty hard once Tiger started yeah, dominating? Tiger proved it. Yeah, they tried Tiger to make it way longer and added in bunkers and shit. Well, I, I I can't see them DJ proofing it unless he shoots twenty under again. I mean, I'll say next year, but isn't the next Masters in like five or six months now? So um, he'll get a chance yeah. to repeat pretty quickly. He'd be it's it's fall versus spring is what you're witnessing. Yeah, and I think that was part of it too, right? Like the greens were a little bit softer. Oh, is you, that right, Jay? Oh yeah, because it's you're you're like it's like their it's their monsoon season down in the south, right? Like right. hurricane season, so it's very humid, wet. So like 
that's all the players need if they can just throw darts. Darts, fine. darts, darts. Yeah, and that's really what they were doing. Like if you watched any of the coverage, you'd see they were they they could go right at the pin, and there was really not much concern that it was going to hit and roll off or anything like that. It was hitting and sticking. Um. Yeah. Anyways, Masters in April will be interesting as well. Uh, let's talk a little hockey here because we still got about 15 minutes. The reverse retros dropped today, and Jay, you had the genius idea of doing a bracket uh, of the reverse retros to crown who is the best. I have a funny feeling that us doing that is just going to end up with the Oilers winning because this is a mainly Oilers podcast. Uh, Go but, Oilers! But we'll do that anyways. We'll we'll get it going on uh, the real life Instagram account. We'll we'll run through all them. Or should we actually? Should we well, maybe let's go ex- through it a little bit on the podcast right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, should Can we I maybe just tell you my favorite one that wasn't the weather? Okay, sure. I love that the Detroit jerseys look mm-hmm. like they forgot they were supposed to participate. Okay, with a new like, design. <laughs> okay, yeah. I was like, where are you going with this? Because I have this as like my because uh, your M truck is for podcast prep asked us to pick the top three and bottom three. They're and- so bad. How because did Stevie Y sign off on that and go like, yep, give her hell, boys. Uh, it looks like a practice jersey. It looks like they got the email notification on like Saturday morning that they were like, remember, these are due. And they were like, you know, no, no, we you didn't know what do it. it. That is the definition of auto draft. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Like they, they just, the exact same logo on a purely yeah. white jersey. It's just, yeah. it's hilarious to me. Yeah, they missed the deadline, so they got the auto draft. Um, their pick. Before we give our top three, bottom three, I kind of just want to go through the divisions because one, there's not a lot of hockey going on. Two, I, I also think this was a great business move by the NHL. We've talked about them needing to get ways to get some money going and all that, and, and find more streams of revenue. Having every single team release a new and unique jersey for the most part a month and a half before Christmas—that's a great way to make a little bit of money, right? 100%. Sure. Yeah. Well, they do it every year, too. Why do they keep releasing Hartford Whalers jerseys? It's just a slap in the face. I, no, I, that's great. I, I, I like I, that. I you can't have the, a team, but you can still have merch. Well, that's the Hurricanes jersey. See, and I'm uh, actually... I'm going to side with Wanye here, and here's the scenario I'll give you. It's the same with the Whalers. It's the same thing with Colorado doing a Nordiques jersey. Oh, that uh, was imagine, great. Let me take you down the terrible wormhole that is Edmonton lost their hockey team. Let's say in the year 2000, Edmonton Oilers moved to Houston and they became the Houston whatchamacallit. Yeah, you can't be wearing Oilers jersey. How like, pissed off would you be? Wearing the of our dead relatives. Yeah, how pissed off would you be if you were an Oilers fan? You're like, <laughs> you, stole my, you stole our team and now you're just parading around our jerseys as well? I think it's bullshit. I'd give them zero credit for doing that. It's like making money off the bones of your predecessor. Dude. But it's also Pretty respecting much. your original fan no. base. No, fuck no. that. No, they're not respecting them, though. If Carolina, like, sponsored a bunch of minor hockey rinks in Hartford, I'd be like, oh, okay. They're respecting them. Making Carolina money needs off their to remember logo. where they came from. See, that- and here's what I'll say. This is like if you stole someone's car, they had no way to get it back, and then every day you drove by their house. It's not like, oh, no, I'm just respecting you by letting you see your car that I stole. It's like, LOL, fuck you. We took your car. There is a way where, and same with the Nordiques, too. Yeah. Like, fuck you, Colorado. But there is a way worse jersey than Detroit. Detroit looks like a practice jersey. There are so many things about this jersey I hate. Is the Anaheim Mighty Ducks what? jersey? Can, can we just say that that jersey is coax? Uh, look at number one. You've got the terrible <laughs> font for the C. Yeah. Brutal. Number two, it's Wild busy. Wing. Okay, I can see Wild Wing, but why do you have to have his whole body and him busting out of ice? Like <laughs> it's so detailed. Why like, do I need all of this information? Just give me a yeah. duck mask, and we're on our way. Third, what's the bottom half of the jersey? Is he busting through? frozen dark blue ice yes what the fuck is that i think it's hilarious i think it's so 90s and so out there Uh, that it'll sell well they never had that yes they did they wore it like that they had a wild wing jersey but i thought it was just the the head no that was was they wore that exact jersey it was an alternate for like one or two seasons no terrible when is the oilers gonna smarten up and bring back the mcfarland see that's what they should have done no fuck that that jersey sucks Shut up, your no, Red No, suck. it's the only thing that we've ever done that's different. Like, that's what I'm so saying. Cool, like, your like, How like, I don't suck. I don't How mind this suck? jersey. You explain it to me in detail, and I will refute every issue you have. The Oilers have the one of the most perfect and iconic logos in all of sports. They should sure. wear that logo 
all the time, 82 games a year, and so that logo should that. never leave their chest. You My say God that, in heaven. You, like, you say that, but you like the Anaheim jersey? Yeah, because I don't give a shit about the Ducks and their logo they have now. They can do whatever they want. There's no sacrilege there. Getting rid of that uh-huh. iconic Oilers logo, mm-mm, I don't stand for but it. But if they're going to do this every single year, which they are. Every year until forever. They take a swing be. at something different. Like, yeah, like, uh, it'll come. You're right. Like that right. guy, um, you know, I talked about this with Wadi before we started recording. Like, remember the the, the oil Derek guy that was on the shoulder? Yes. Got him on the front for a year. No. Who gives a shit? Like, try something different. And you know where they missed the mark? They should have reversed the logo yeah. jerseys. Or the Vancouver logo color. The yeah. Where's the deep V? Oh, the yeah. Brown. You know what I do respect in all this, though? And this is where, again, these motherfuckers, you got, you got Vegas looking into their past and recreating the Las Vegas Thunder, yeah. which is unbelievable. And then you have the Detroit Red Wings sending in that abomination. Vegas is like, let's use our infinite budget to do a bunch of research. It'd be totally cool. Um, I also, I like the the Lady Liberty coming back to the New York Rangers. I love the Pittsburgh oh, really? one. With you Pittsburgh don't want the desk. Oilers to have a different logo and you like the alternate logo of the Rangers. Because yeah, I don't give a shit about them. You're all over the God. No, oh, God. I'm not. I I'm passionate. You're all over the road. I'm passionate about the Oilers, and I want their logo to stay. I could give a shit what the New York Rangers do, and I think the Lady You're Liberty drunk, cool. he, It's called reverse retro. So we have to go retro on some of this stuff. The Oilers did. That's an ode to the uh, WHA. Not, no, 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 no. I'm talking about the Rangers. The Rangers did not. The Capitals did not. Yeah, they did. It's all like, I, uh, that's, that's not retro. That's like in the early O's. That's what the Oilers, whatever, McFarlane mechanical semen one is. I'm a big fan of the Kings jersey. Yeah, that that one, the purple and yellow. Beautiful. beautiful. I guess Ridiculous my other question kid. in all of this is, how come only some of the jerseys have a Captain C on the front and some don't? Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, um, Detroit didn't have time even to put the C on their jersey. Yeah, like, dude, in New so Jersey, what is going on? Could that actually be because those teams don't have captains? Dylan Larkin's the captain in Detroit. Is he actually? Yep. Boom. Wow. You're fired. Bag milk knows stuff. He knows everything. I don't think he, he is. I could be lying. Dylan wow. Larkin. Dylan Larkin's an assistant. No, he named, yeah, he was named captain for uh oh, yeah, thank he was God. Named yeah, there's a captain in the on the Rangers on your favorite jersey. Yeah, your Rangers. favorite team. Okay, no, hold up. Ryan Strom is the captain of the New York Rangers, I believe. No, he's not. Um, there's an article from a week ago in a Detroit newspaper saying he deserves to be captain, but he's not. Larkin is not captain. Uh, there are seven captain vacancies in the NHL. This from an article 10 days ago. The Sens, Devils, Rangers, Blues, Red Wings, Golden Knights, and Minnesota Wild. And I believe those you are... You did it, your own Jack. That's why. Everybody that doesn't have a captain doesn't have that. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. They, job, they're going to do... I'm looking at one from uh, the Detroit Free Press where I get, you are right, Tyler. I was wrong. But everybody is saying that Larkin will be named yeah. captain for the ne- upcoming season. Well, that's the Sam case the fucking, it could be Sam Gagne. It could be Sam Gagne scenario all over again. <laughs> Why well, it's time to write an article for Wings Nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Sam Gagne Fuck. should be your captain. That'd actually be a funny article, like an Oilers fan telling Wings fans why Gagne should be their captain. The more I learn he about him, the more, the more I convinced that the Oilers fucked up then and really magnitude-wise fucked him now. He could still be captain, except for Connor, of course. I think Connor would give up. Wasn't there a tradition? There was a tradition or something, wasn't there? Hold on, you Oilers? think Connor would give up the captain? No, I'm would. kidding, I'm kidding. Oh, fuck. No, but had had <laughs> he been captain when Connor came in the league, Connor would still have to have been named captain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like... Um, that good, hey? That, like, no matter who's been in the league, no matter who has experience, and blah blah blah, they're just like step aside. The wonder kid is now nineteen. It's like when uh, it's like when Gretzky went to the Blues, and Shane Corson is just like, yeah, he should have this. <laughs> Shane oh. Corson, remember when we made him captain for a hot second? Yep. That didn't go too well. Hey, I don't remember it before my time, but that didn't go well. That was a crazy year, though. Wasn't the same year that that George Burnett was like coach for half an hour and then captain was stripped and it was all over the place. Rivals I just want to go back to the jerseys there. real quick and say that the Canucks jersey is awful. Yeah, they could have I mean, gone with that black one, yeah. the classic one from the nineties, and they with the V. Gone. Go even deeper, the V. See, I would have gone to the V. I would have gone to the flying skate, but like they could have yeah. done that. The, the Leafs one's one pretty gross too. Like I get the era. No, I actually like the Leafs one for yeah. some reason. 
I don't know why, because I just look old timey to me. So I kind of like it. I'll, that's the only time I'll say anything positive about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Okay, I know I asked you guys to do uh, top three, bottom three kind of thing, but what I actually sort of want to do is just go division by division and each say our favorite and the least favorite. Um, so we'll start in the Pacific. I'm going to take the Oilers out of it because, I mean, we could probably all say the Oilers. Those things are sweet. But my favorite in the Pacific is definitely going to be the LA Kings. I think that jersey, that logo Not the combined. the Anaheim Ducks. Uh, no, I I like that Kings one a little bit more, but I will say I think Vancouver, Ve- I think Vancouver, LA, Arizona, Anaheim, Edmonton, Calgary all did really really well. Um, but the Kings is my favorite in the Pacific. I don't get why everybody's so horny about the the Coke horse from Calgary. I think it's sharp. The Coke horse. The Coke horse. He does. He looks like a Coke horse. I don't know. Allegedly, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> um, anyone else favorite in the Pacific? That's not the Oilers. Oh, yeah. Just going with the Oilers there. Uh, least, uh, I, know well, I would have gone. Answer. I would have gone Kings, but uh, if I had to pick another one, just to be silly and kind of have some fun, <laughs> I would go uh, Phoenix. Wow! And wow. by Phoenix, I mean Arizona. I don't mind that one. I really, I really, really, really don't like the Vegas one. I get what they were doing with the lines. No, it's and, cool. No, I think that logo's dumb, and I think the red is kind of stupid as well. I'm not a big fan of the Vegas jersey. How can you be mad at a color? What are they? What were they trying to do? Like their e- ECHL team or something? Yeah, no, from the, like, uh, the the was the Thunder, the Vegas the Thunder. Vegas Thunder. Yeah, yeah. Remember when the IHL was on fire and the San Diego Gulls was signing people, and then uh, Las Vegas Thunder had Manorio. Um, the other Western Conference division, some interesting ones. I'm not gonna pick the Colorado Avalanche one because I think like they even have the little what are those called the Fleur de Fleur de Lee. Yeah, but you're in Colo fucking Rado. That makes no Remember sense. Remember where you came from? No, Ray uh, Bork. Colorado, not my favorite. Minnesota is my favorite because that green and gold color is nasty. That's but remembering where you came from. The North Stars, your Remchuk. That's that, that's a slap in the face to Wild fans. <laughs> no, it's not. And here's the difference: the Minnesota Wild are honoring the heritage of hockey in Minnesota. The Dallas Stars, who took the Minnesota North Stars away, they are not allowed to wear that. But Minnesota, I'll allow it because it's still Dallas Minnesota. Have, that was my beef. Dallas should have Minnesota colors. Minnes- what the fuck? Did- <laughs> and then the Winnipeg Jets missed out on going full oh, on Thrashers. Yeah, Thrasher. They should have gone with the Thrashers. They should have gone Thrasher. Oh. Maroon and blue. No, the Jets did fuck up because those jerseys suck. Uh, they don't even I like make the logo. Sense. Yeah, the logo's don't. good. I don't like the the color yeah. pattern well, the- or whatever they did. Uh, in the East, in the Atlantic, I think we're all going to kind of agree that the Detroit one doesn't make a ton of sense. But I'll say this, that Tampa That's Bay the jersey. the jersey that got released today. The Tampa Bay jersey is awesome. I love that. That logo is sweet. You know what it's, my favorite one is? Don't say the Buffalo one. Sorry, um, I interrupted before I was going to announce mine. Oh, add more, uh, uh, I, I interrupted bag milk before I said mine, so I want to add more dramatic effect. What were you saying about Tampa Bay Mill? I wasn't saying anything. I said the best one that got released today is the Detroit Red Wings because they gave zero fucks on this project. Yeah, it is they don't want like, to sell a jersey. They don't want to sell any of these. They couldn't have put any less effort into their reverse retro, and that makes me laugh. And for that reason alone, they're my winner on the day. Get a Dylan Larkin one with the captain's C on it. It will be coming. I have no guarantee. My I favorite on this page is... I, I I don't know why. It's the Panthers. They're nice. I'll agree with you there. They're nice. Yeah. I think they should be wearing those over what they wear now. Like, I like that logo. I like that color scheme. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, the last division we haven't talked about is uh, the Metro. I kind of like what Columbus did. I think those are pretty sharp, and I think that's a great logo. Um, I don't like the Whalers for reasons already stated. I like Lady Liberty, but my favorite's actually going to be Pittsburgh. I think that's really, really sharp. I love, love it. I think that's, that's like, sharp. I could picture I could picture Mario Lemieux wearing that exact jersey. That's the purpose of retro. I respect the fact too that on the NHL website, I'm just reading the breakdown, and they say for the Penguins, Mario Lemieux won his sixth scoring title this season, but the biggest cultural impact came from the diagonal lettering he and rapper Snoop Dogg wore in their respective arenas. Ah. Yeah, because the minute I saw that, I'm like, that's the jersey Snoop is wearing when he's riding on the front of that bike. Yep, you're right. Bang on with that. I'm upset that the Islanders didn't choose to go back to Captain Highliner. You know yeah. I mean? Also, you want to talk about a team that just kind of gave up and that's, didn't that's do anything? That's their New Jersey. That's this season. They never had that blue in the retro. Yeah. that's That was a just an They should have went with choice. that other blue, that more royal blue looking. Yeah. 
Um, they should have gone Captain Highlander, though, and with their new colors. I think that would have been sick. Oh, yeah, you like the gimmicks, don't you? Uh, also, the gone, Dallas Stars should have done their Archie horse. cartoon on the front. <laughs> I always right. hated the Jersey Devils uh, when they had the green color scheme, and yeah. I still hate it now. So oh, I think it's cool, but Danico I respect it. Here? But yeah, exa- that's exactly the name I think of when I see that. <laughs> Ken Danico. Right. And Ken Danico is from Edmonton. So by <laughs> default, New Jersey Devils is the best out of the Metropolitan. All right, before we get to our guest this week, Twig and Berries has put together something uh, pretty cool. It's an easy way to get your Christmas shopping done in, in just one swoop. They got a holiday gift box. It's their best-selling Connor hoodie. One pair of Nutsack underwear, one pair of their Active Fit socks. You get their Ultra Slim wallet, their Tumblr, and their toque. It's only 150 bucks, and it's valued at much more than that. Twigandberries.ca, check it out, do that, or you can uh, shop around. Use the promo code NATION15. It gets you 15% off your order. Twigandberries.ca. All right, we got a very special guest joining us on episode 231 of the Real Life Podcast. While I bring him in, I want to bring you, the listener, since this is a podcast, it's audio, to a better place. There's 18,000 people in Rogers Place. It's Saturday night. You're watching the Oilers play, and there's a lull. There's a TV timeout. Maybe the crowd's a little quiet. The music's going, and you look on the big screen. All of a sudden, a man emerges. He's wearing what appears to be one orange shirt. He gets up. He starts stomping his feet. And the crowd roars. The crowd gets louder. And he's dancing. And you see him reach. He pulls off his shirt. And you're thinking, what is he doing? But there are more shirts underneath. And he begins throwing them into the crowd. And everything is good. There's no pandemic. You're just cheering on the Oilers. And you're more fired up because this guy is in the crowd. Cameron Hughes, author of King of Cheer. He is the professional fan. Joins us on the Real Life Podcast. Cameron, how's it going? Wow, I wish I was twirling some shirts and going crazy with all of your Rogers plays this second. Oh, I miss it so much. Oh, yeah, we we all do. I saw a video of the Oilers playoff run and just seeing a video even of 18,000 people in one arena like feels weird to me right now after the last seven months. But I can't wait to get back to that point. I'm sure you're with me on that as well. I'm sure you're excited for the first time you can get back in a rink. Well, yeah, first off, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, it's 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 one thing I've been saying and and I'm not just lip service. I really believe when it does come back, people are going to be louder. They're going to be more engaged. They're going to be more connected. And I hope it lasts. You know what I mean? Yeah. I hope, the, you know, no, I'm not just saying Edmonton. I'm saying across the board. I hope people come and realize how lucky we are to be able to connect, to get crazy, to come together as a community, you know, and, and, and cheer on our favorite team, you know, as opposed to watch it from our, you know, our lazy boy. Yeah, and I think it's a little bit of like, you don't know what you have till it's gone, right? Like no one saw this coming. No one thought there would be a point where, you know, your favorite team's making the playoffs and you can't be in the rink. So I think you're bang on with that. I think when we finally do get back, watching sports live, being in the arena, having a beer or whatever, that's that's not going to be something I'm at least ever going to take for granted again. I'm with you on that. And I, I think the teams are going to, uh, you know, teams are also going to need to, you know, remember that. You know, if a lot of teams I work with in sports, like they have an entertainment department. And I'm like, I would amp up your entertainment department once it gets going because we're going to need that. We're yeah. going to all need that. We're going to need to look at, you know, Look at other people, someone else in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not sure if you're going to want a sweaty t-shirt, but hey. <laughs> Just based on that question or that thought, Cameron, is I know to me in my head, I would kind of default to like maybe Vegas as a place that puts on kind of the best show because it is Vegas after all. But is there an NHL rink that you've been to that maybe surprises people with what they're doing in there? In a good way? Yeah, <laughs> yeah in a good or in a bad both, way either way. Both. Yeah, I'd like to hear both. Well, you guys, I'm going to get fired by every team in the NHL. No, um, I, I, you know, it's funny. I think that Vegas, let's just start with Vegas. Vegas, from the first game, and I've done 52 games there, um, you know, there's a permission to act crazy there on a Tuesday night as much as there is on a Friday or Saturday, you know? Yep. And, and, and the Canadian teams that we've been to, we know, you know, they, they kind of cater towards the big night, you know, as opposed to a Tuesday against, you know, Arizona, right? Yeah. But Vegas is like full on. You come and act any way you want, dress any way you want. They also have the, the luxury of, you know, if it's a Tuesday and they're playing against Chicago, there's 4,000 Chicago fans there, yeah. right? So they've played into that really well. They've made other teams feel welcome. I've done a game where Edmonton was playing there, and the Oilers fans were like, hey, what's up? I saw your Rogers place. And I'm always like, no, it wasn't me. It was my twin. <laughs> <laughs> then in terms of other arenas, you know, I – there's some that are like you, you think are going to be more engaged, more exciting than they are. Um, 
I'll never forget doing a New Jersey Devils game in 2008. And I thought it was going to be crazy. And they looked at me and they're like, good luck tonight. I'm like, wait a minute, you just hired me. What are you talking about? <laughs> and it was, it was like, there was nothing, nothing in that crowd. But they hire you to get the crowd going so you find a way. I, I, we're that gonna sounds get, like Edmonton on a Monday night. Well, yeah, and I, I was going to say, we're going to get into your career and all that, but I want to talk specifically about Edmonton a little bit then because you've done a ton of games at Rogers Place and around Oilers Nation here, a lot of people say, well, the atmosphere in Rogers is nowhere near what it was in the old rink here. Do you get that sense as well? Like at, at times, people call it a library in Edmonton. Do you get that sense? And I guess part two would be, what can teams be doing to, to app up the atmosphere in their arena on a regular season night? Look, I didn't experience a lot in the old arena, but, yeah. you know, I grew up, a, I did grow up an Oilers fan, um, you know, from Ottawa. I grew up with, you know, like, you know, the, the Gretzky, the Messier, the, I, I, I love following it. And you could tell watching at home that there was a sense of, you know, an extra little crazy there. I think that what happened in sports is, I didn't really go into this in the book, but I sort of did. It's like they built these arenas that are almost too, too fancy. They're, we're too spoiled. You know, the, the video boards are too big. Um, and people are like, well, I'm going to spend this much money on my beer. I'm just going to do whatever I want. Right. And I truly believe guys that there's, there's, you buy a ticket. I joke with people all the time. You buy a ticket, you can do what you want with it. It's your seat. It's your game. It's your money. Right. But I truly believe in that ticket. And part of that ticket is a responsibility for the fan to get behind the team a few times each game. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to players from, you know, junior hockey all the way to the NHL who say, like, I can't believe the crowd wasn't behind us that night. Or, like, why, like there's moments of games from Rogers Place to everywhere I've been where you're like, fans, like, right now is the time. Come on. Do something. And I think that Canadian markets, and I've experienced this, I've performed it, except for the Canucks, every other team, is, is there's there's a responsibility to, like, come together, you know? Yeah. And I, I've been at Rogers Place, and I remember – I remember getting up once and getting the crowd really crazy. And then within seconds, they're all sitting down. It's like, oh, everyone, shh, shh, you know, and I was like, okay, that's what you want to do. That's your choice. But then don't complain if your fans aren't loud. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm not knocking anyone. And, 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 but I'm just saying, like, if you're going to, if you're going to knock the fact that, oh, it's quiet, well, then do something about it, you know? Yeah. I think that's yeah. a great point as well. Do you have something, maybe like an idea of what, I mean, obviously hiring you is one of them, the idea that to get people fired up, but like, what else do you see? Like maybe, Hey, we're not talking about Vegas where Tuesday night you're allowed to go out and get silly. Or, I mean, I guess you are, but is there something to be like, Hey, well, maybe we should be looking at doing this. Is it music or is it presentation on the boards or like what, what comes to mind when you think of that? You know, <laughs> I've said this to so many different teams in pre-production meetings and, and on and on and on rip up the script. And, and what I mean by that is I totally understand. You guys understand. You're smart guys that, 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 you, that, that, you know, Rogers Place has to sell different products. They have promotional bits, the sponsors. I get that. We all know we get that. It pays the bills, right? It keeps the lights on. But why are you doing – Why are, I'm, not, I'm not pointing out Rogers. In general, why are you doing a 90-second to two-minute promotion during this timeout? You've just killed me. I, I'm like yeah. – I'm, I'm sick now. So every commercial on TV is under 60 seconds for a reason. So there should be no timeouts in the NHL that are longer than 60 seconds of a promotional paid advertisement. None. You can get it across. The next 30 seconds to 60 seconds should be music, should be videos of fans going crazy, should be something clever to trigger that out, whatever it might be, a funny YouTube video, whatever it is, that's what teams need to do. I believe. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I think that's and then a, and then and then the fans because we are our own worst enemies because we yeah. beat ourselves up about why it's quiet but then won't stand up to lead the charge to make noise. So we also have to subscri subscribe to those prompts because I'm starting to notice that uh, and this is more Oilers uh, centric. Is I, I'm seeing they're trying to trigger us here and there and do more to get us amped up, but we're not responding. It's a two way street. I know it is. You guys are so into the game. You know everything. You know. You know what Dry Sidle had for lunch today. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, you guys, like the Canadian fan. This isn't just Edmonton. This is across the country. You know, you're, you're so engaged in the game. You're so interested. You're also paying a lot of money to go to the game. So you're kind of like, hey, if I want to cheer, I'm going to cheer. If I don't, hey, you know what I mean? 
But then you come along, like we're fans on the inside, and you come along and you get us like on our feet in like three seconds. Like you just quickly just remove that mental hurdle from us somehow because like obviously you bring a lot of energy to it and we subscribe to it. But it's funny, like, and then we'll just sit back down and go quiet. But then we'll go to Nashville, we'll go to Vegas, or you'll go watch hockey in Europe. And you'll be like, holy fuck, they're standing and singing this whole time. It's so amazing. And then I'll get back on the plane, go home to Edmonton and sit in my seat and be quiet. Well, I mean, I've always said to teams, like, why don't you find, I don't know, half a dozen, you know, deviant type fans. And I don't literally mean deviant, but like fans that are like more engaged than normal. Right. And, and empower them, you know, mm-hmm. get, you know, get them in the room after and have some beers with them and talk to them about, you know, getting the crowds going at different times and, you know, like you said, you know, why aren't you leading the charge? Well, because you're worried about what the person next to you might think. If there was a game I did in Edmonton, and I'm going to share this story, and my book's already out, so we'll see what happens. I'm just going to share it with you. <laughs> there was, it was a while. It was maybe the last game I did in Edmonton. And it was about two minutes left in the game. And I'm trying to get sections up on their feet. to get the, It was against Calgary. I don't know if you remember that game. And I think we're down by one or tied. It was close, right? And there's two minutes to go, and I'm, like, trying to get everyone up. And they all get up, and then two seconds later, they all sit down. And so I'm, like, now I'm chirping with them. <laughs> now I'm chirping with fans that have actually paid me to come because I'm, like, it's up to you guys. But don't complain that you weren't loud. Every arena, every fan in the NHL with one minute to go, if you're up or if you're down by a goal, should be on their feet. Mm-hmm. And if you don't think so, then I don't know what the definition of fan is. I, I'm lost for words. I, yeah. I think you guys can tell in my voice how strongly I feel about that. The other 59 minutes, do what you really do what you want. But you don't think that those players who hustle their asses off every night want to hear the crowd say, hey, guys, we believe in you right now? Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. Generally. Why aren't they doing it? It's yeah. like, that's what home ice advantage is supposed to be. Yeah. And then there's other moments. I mean, one of the most memorable games, uh, you know, that I can remember in my career, and I, I obviously don't remember a lot of them, but the Oilers brought me in for game six of the playoff game against Anaheim a couple of years ago. I mean, remember it was, what, 6 nothing or something? It was crazy, yeah. right? Dry saddle hat trick, all that good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I got off, and I started going, and I can't remember if it was 0 zero one nothing. And I literally could have waltzed to Adele and the crowd would have gone nuts. Like there was something electric. Like people came that night with this, this something. You know what I mean? I don't know how to describe it. You guys were there, but it's like, what are we doing to feed that before fans are getting there as well? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm what are we doing on social? What are we doing uh, you know, in, in the news? You know, you know what I mean? Like there's all these different layers across the NHL that, that you need to look at. We're talking with uh, Cameron Hughes. Of course, we've got King of Cheer out. Uh, Cameron, I'm on your website, CameronHughes.tv, and I see you've done NHL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and NFL. Is there a difference in your approach when you're doing a different league, or is it all kind of the same thing that you're looking at doing? The initial like, big moment, big hit is the same across the board. It's to create a sense of spontaneous fun and to basically be like, have that moment where like, all right, I'm here. Like, come with me. We're going for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's what happened when I started 26 years ago in Ottawa when the crowd was like, stone cold quiet. I really try to create that same sense of like, if you've never seen me, you're like, who is he? What's he doing? And if you have, you're also like, maybe you're going, oh, this is going to be fun. The crazy t-shirt guy's here or that guy that I get called. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, but otherwise, you know, it's a good question because there are some events I've done from like the U.S. Open tennis, and then you go to like some ECHL or minor league games where you can literally do anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and then there's the NBA, which is like super scripted, where it's like five, four, okay, go. You know, and you're like, wait a minute, you know, why is this so programmed? But that's just their branch. Interesting. Have you, what's, uh, you've done obviously a ton of different leagues, a ton of different levels. Have you ever gotten like a weird request from a team? Gotten them to be like, "Hey, can you do this?" And you're like, "Ooh, I don't know if I'm if I'm real comfortable doing that." Well, that story's in my book. There I mean, you go. I, I did a Chicago Bulls playoff game, and I went against everything I ever believed in, and 
they asked me to be a contestant on a for a dance contest during an intermission. And they said I would win, and the crowd would go wild, and I'd run from the court into the stands and rip open my shirt and get the crowd going. Well, I didn't want to do it. I just knew in my gut I got to stick to what works. Long story short, I decided to do it. They're paying me. Give it a shot. But it's Chicago. It's the vote. Yeah. 23,000 people, right? I'm on center court. First guy goes, not so good. Second guy goes, he's 70-plus-year-old senior citizen wearing a full-on Bulls tracksuit. And he was a friend of someone in the, who worked for the organization. And he was on the floor locking and popping like there's no way anyone had a shot. <laughs> Never compete against the kid or a senior or an older gentleman, right? Yeah, yeah. He killed it. I should have just walked off the court and just been like, okay, all you, you know what I mean? So I performed next. I'm the last to go. I've got everything's like, oh, I'm like just I'm like, I don't want to be here, right? But he's just 22,000 people. <laughs> so he wins. I go to my stage manager. We get off the court. I'm trying to smile, pretend I'm happy. And I was legitimately like mad. I was like, you guys told me you set me up. You know, the whole thing in my world, guys, is set me up for success. Give me that 70 seconds. Give me an extra 10 seconds so that the fans will come with me. Anyhow, I go back to my seat because now I've got to do my reveal. And I'm thinking, I'm second place. They're not going to like me. <laughs> right? Anyhow, they come to me next quarter, next break, and they're looking at me, and I'm kind of like playing the crowd. Like, I came second. I get up, and the place goes nuts. So sometimes you have to trust your producers. <laughs> yeah. um, One of my favorite things is, like I said, I'm on your website, and you've got – awesome stats on here. And my favorite one that I'm looking at right now is most shirts successfully layered and removed at 23. <laughs> so I just want to know, like, what's it kind of like sitting there with 23 shirts? Because you kind of go full Joey Tribbiani there where you got the whole you got the whole wardrobe on, but I've seen you do it multiple times and it's fun. It's always fun watching you rip those things off and throw them under the crowd. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because someone was asking me, like, we're doing a serious thing once. He's like, I don't understand how you make sure it's just the next T-shirt. And I'm like, I've been doing this for 25 years. I figured out how to grab the next one. There was a game I put on 23 T-shirts, and I was waiting for the timeout, like, you know, to go. And I was waiting and waiting, and I was like, I'm going to die here. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's like, you know, for me, it's like that moment you see people laugh and have fun. That's what it's all about, you know. I've, I've had a lot of slack in my career for, oh, I saw you in this arena that night. I thought you were this fan. At the end of the day, people, you know, when they find out that I do this for other teams, they just laugh and say, oh, good for you, you know, for the most well, part. Well, I want to ask about that. Like, your career, like you said, has spanned 26 years now. Looking back at the early days with the Senators, do you get time to just reflect on how crazy it is that you were a fan at a Sens game and now you're traveling around doing this in multiple leagues and multiple cities? Yeah, I mean, I yeah, <laughs> I actually get overwhelmed. I get emotional. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I do because I work my ass off, you know, and I face uh, measurable amounts of rejection. I've faced a lot of doubt. I've faced a lot of uh, fans throwing shit at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> enough about Buffalo, um, <laughs> but, but you know, death threats in New Jersey, which is true, which is in the book. But then you have those moments where you're exhausted and you get off the plane and you get in the crowd and you get that kid up and the kid's twirling the shirt and the crowd's going wild and you're like, it was all worth it, you know? Um, in a million years, if, you know, if you thought I'd tell you that 26 years later, I, I, I've been this fortunate to do it, I would tell you you're crazy. But then you, when you put a book together, you realize you connect the dots, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I met Bob Nicholson in 2009 at the – when he was doing Hockey Canada, I was doing a... Do you remember the Pepsi uh, campaign? The, a, the new oh, cheer? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was the voice and, and part of the name behind that. Was speaking of death threats. And, you know, trying to get a new cheer for Canada and all this sort of stuff. But I met Bob there. And then that's how I got into Edmonton. You know, uh, nine, eight, nine years later. So all these things that you do in your life, these connecting the dots, when you look back, you go, oh, it sort of made sense. You know what I mean? So it all started in Ottawa, and the stories are all going to be in your book, King of Cheer, which I highly recommend. Not hockey fans, sports fans in general, go and check out. It'd be an excellent Christmas present because we know that's just around the corner. But So you start, you just get up one night in Ottawa. That's kind of the way it started. Then management comes to you. 
What's going through your head when Senator's management comes up to you and says, like, hey, we want you to come back, keep doing this? Um, you know, it was, they literally came to me that first night. They came and asked me, like, the head of the guy, his entertainment person, like a runner intern, came and asked me for my number. And I was like, I thought they were trying to kick me out, right? <laughs> um, and then I met with them the next week. They actually called me. And I remember sitting in their office, Randy was his name, and he was kind of like, so what were you thinking? What was that all about? And I, guys, I had no idea. Like, I didn't know what they wanted me to do. You know what I mean? I'd been a mascot for a baseball team and I was crazy guy at university wearing a watermelon on my head, getting the football games going. It was, it was really weird, you know? And, and I, I didn't know how to kind of do what I did. So that's evolved a lot, my performances, you know? Looking at the list of some of these quotes you've got, um, one that I just, I can't, I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it, is obviously you got the quote from Connor. We all love Connor because we're Oilers fans, but to dance with Novak Djokovic. It's just, is there somebody that you can think of that you're just like, I can't believe that I'm interacting with this person ever in a million years? I mean, that's, yeah, it's a pretty easy answer. I was, uh, so I did the U.S. Open tennis, which was, you know, I won't give it away, but it was kind of crazy how I got it. They said no, and I convinced them to give me one shot and one dollar. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you ever, if someone wants to hire you and they say no, say I'll do it for a dollar and prove them. And that's, that's sort of my thing. Anyhow, yeah. so I'm, I'm doing the U.S. Open. I get a call. It's, to, it's Tony Godsick. It's Roger Federer's agent. Okay. And he says, do you want to come to Roger Federer's charity event? And I'm thinking, yes, I do. <laughs> And he's playing in a tennis tournament in Seattle with Bill Gates. And he says, how much? And I said, for what? <laughs> it's a charity event. Yeah. I'm, I'll be there. So I, they fly me up, pay for all of that, which is great. And he goes, we're going to surprise Roger. And I'm thinking to myself, guys, I'm this kid from Canada. Could barely make the tennis team. All I won was the sportsmanship award. And we're surprising Roger better. Okay, sure. Sounds like a great plan. So I'm for 18,000 people. I get up and do my shtick. And there's a video that is just ingrained in me of Roger Federer and Bill Gates sitting beside each other, giggling like schoolboys, watching me. <laughs> wow. So we, so we surprised them. Unbelievable. Then after the cherry match, his agent brings Roger to my quote unquote dressing room without me knowing it and walks in and we're in the hallway and I meet Roger for the first time. And Roger says, uh, you know, I'm, oh, I love watching at the U.S. Open. There's a video of him watching me once that got, like, blew up on the Internet. He was supposed to be focused. And Tony tells him that I agreed to come and do the charity event. And Roger looks at me, like, with the most gentlemanly approach and vibe, saying how much he appreciated it. He's about to go out to play his big match against Isner, but half an hour later, he's standing about 20 feet away. I'm standing there. I'm like, do I go over there and say something? Of course I did. <laughs> so I'm like, Roger, good luck. What do you want me to do for the crowd? And we talk, talk, talk. He tells me what he wants me to do. And then his final line is, the more you do, the less I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic line. Um, right. You mentioned the U.S. Open stuff. It, on your website, it says you've done Olympics as well. I, the, the last sort of question I have just on like how your career progressed is, so it starts in Ottawa. Senators management comes to you. When did it take the next step or when was there a big leap where it went from doing this in Ottawa to, I mean, sort of what you are now, like a professional fan? Was there like a big break somewhere in there? Yeah, I got a booking agent uh, who represented different acts from Crazy George to literally like a dog that catches Frisbees at minor league games <laughs> <laughs> uh, to Morgana the Kissing Bandit. And he was out of Tulsa and he had this agency that represented all these different acts and he signed me on and I started touring. Like I was, you know, touring mostly like minor league stuff like Spokane and Nashville and all these smaller leagues. And that sort of helped me develop a career, you know, like, you know, a yeah. couple, a couple of games a week. You, uh, you showed us before we started recording the wall of jerseys behind you. How many jerseys do you think you got in that room you're in right now? Um, I think I have about a hundred in here and then I have another, uh, couple boxes in storage. <laughs> wow. That is fantastic. Uh, I, I mean, I, just because of all the jerseys behind you right now, I, I have to ask, have you had a chance to look at any of the reverse retros that came out today from the NHL? I saw some reverse retros, and uh, there's, there's some good ones, but I think this is the best retro. You can't see it, but killer bees. Uh, yeah, there's some cool stuff. I don't, I don't, I think some of the teams are like, I don't understand. They're not really retro. They're just yeah. like, 
I, like Google Retro. Like, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We had a we had a thirty we had a, leading up to this interview. We had a thirty minute discussion about this. Thank you. It's a retro jersey. It's Make not it retro. To be a funky, cool jersey. It's retro. So go retro, right? Yeah, I think that that is a good point. Like some teams didn't really follow that guideline at all. I don't know. I just think this was clearly like the league wants to make a little bit of money. So everyone drop a jersey a month and a half before Christmas and uh, see where it goes from there. Uh, For you, the author King of Cheer, it's out now writing the book. How long has this kind of been in the works for for you? Like, how did it come together? What's that process been like? I'm assuming this is the first time you've written a book. Yeah, I mean, I could barely finish an essay in school. <laughs> you know, let's be honest. Uh, I had some academic issues, shocking. Uh, you know, I have a bit of a focus problem. That's why, but for two hours a night, I can really focus. Um, you know, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I've had different iterations of it. And then I finally realized, guys, like, get out of your own way. Don't be, don't BS anyone. What do people want to hear? They just want to hear those little stories that we're sharing right now. They don't want, like, 12 chapters of this and that. So it's, it's a collection of short stories that are, some are funny, some are inspirational, some are moving. So, you know, I talk about some pretty personal stuff that helps shape who I am and some are just ridiculous, you know? The one thing that I wanted to ask you before we get, uh, before we wrap up is you mentioned a lot of rejection over the years as you were kind of working through it. Where did you kind of, is there a person or is it just an internal fire that, how did you get through that rejection to just keep going forward? You're like, this is what I'm going to do. And I don't care who stands in the way. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of like the, the kind of like the Rudy moment. And I, I'm not comparing myself to Rudy, but I, I, I was in LA and I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to make it. I was trying to do acting and TV and I was having a really hard time and literally living on, you know, friends couches when I was decided to go down there and pursue like the bigger picture and I just realized that, like, I didn't really have a plan B, you know? Uh, I had a job working in a restaurant when I first started, and I quit the night before because I was like, no, this is what I want to do. And I was stubborn, stupid, resilient, and, and maybe looking back, brilliant, but it was pretty stressful at times. But, there was, yeah, I mean, to be really clear, I had this belief button in me. I have a belief button in me that not only is what I'm going to do for your game going to be make the game more fun, but I believe that, I, I believe, I just believe, I don't like, it's just this thing, you know, and the more you do it, the more you get the muscle, so, you know, the more that muscle gets, you know, it gets stronger and you prove yourself to people and then they believe in you. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you can't just sugarcoat me. Like I was at the NHL finals this year. Okay. Well, how did you get there? Right. So yeah, you, cool. Do you still get to enjoy hockey as well? Or is it more like this is a work thing for you now, or do you still get to enjoy the game? Yeah, I mean, I for the most part, I do. I mean, I'm pretty focused. If you've ever seen me, uh, <laughs> if you've ever seen me get going, I get pretty into the zone. And I always tell I have an intern or a stage manager. I'm like, if I get a little intense, like, hey, don't take it personally. <laughs> well, um, but got yeah, it. There's, there's moments that I, for sure I get into it. Uh, what's your sort of like pre show you yeah pre performance routine like? Like, how do you get into that zone? Are there like steps you take? <laughs> To get Lots yourself of stretching, I assume. Yeah, like I saw there's a video of you, you know, doing the crossovers backstage and all that. Like, what's your routine like leading up to game time? The last weather game I did, I was shared the locker room with an anthem singer and we did voice warm ups together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he thought I was great. crazy. He was like, Are you serious? I'm like, Yeah, well, you're going to sing and I'm going to cheer. Um, yeah, I do, I do voice warm ups. I go for a run around the arena. I mean, I remember being at Rogers Place behind the Zamboni. And I'm stretching, and there's like the ref security is like looking at me like, "What's he doing?" <laughs> it's the best. Uh, have you it. have you ever had someone you're sitting next to before a performance recognize you? Yeah. Oh yeah, it happens. It happens a few times. I mean, in Vegas now, it happens a lot. Yeah. They're like, "Oh, there," you know. But it's always funny. The best is when they don't know, and I'm always like, "Hey, this is boring, right?" <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I remember, I have, I'm assuming every, this is like the arc of every uh, fan and, and team that you work with. It's like, all of a sudden, like, I'm at an Oiler game, and there's this guy in, like, section 210 going crazy, getting that whole section going. I'm like, oh, my God, that's, that's, that's our super fan. Like, we got we to gotta do more with that guy. And then you'll go to, like, another game, and he's like, and then you'll see, you'll see you again. You're like, oh, he's back again. This is awesome. Because we think you're from Edmonton. You think you're, you know, you're an Edmontonian. And then all of a sudden... 
you can see how the production then starts kind of uh, changing and and and, and uh, how they kind of set it up for you to um, when they like they pan through the crowd and all of a sudden they'll focus on you and you'll just be like sipping on a cup, looking surprised. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute, this guy's a pro. But then I don't care because you're you're you you clearly get us fucking going, which is the best. I'm assuming like everyone kind of goes on that arc, like claiming you as their own. Yeah, I mean it's happened, you know. And then when they find out that I'm not from there, you know, some fans have been really, really mad and come after me physically. But uh, you know, that was New Jersey story, um, and which uh, is insane, Jersey. by the way. Yeah, that's yeah. fucked. Uh, but and then there's other teams that like Vegas, for example. I, I never pretended. Like I mean, Vegas never had a hockey team. They never had a sports team. So like I, from the second I arrived there, I was like. Hey, I've done this at 18 other NHL rinks. I'm going to bring everything I've learned to you and let's go. Let's have some fun. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if I, I pretended anywhere along the way that I was, you know, something different, then I would have, I wouldn't buy into it either. You know? Again, we've got, I'm on, uh, I'm on Cameron Hughes uh, TV. I'm just looking at all the stuff you got on your website. You can buy the book here as well, but I've always had a goal in my life to be booed by a room full of people. And you had it happen at Madison Square Garden. What was that like? That sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I was dancing. I was getting the crowd going. And then they went to me. And I got them. Like, I was in the early days with some buddies having some beers. And they were like, try to get the crowd going tonight. Like, this is a joke. And they went to me. And I got them going. And then third period, they went to me. I got them going. And then they went to Dancing Larry, the famous guy, the bald guy up in 300. And then they came back to me, and then they booed me out of the arena. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's Know good. your audience, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a ton of just great stories, and uh, they're in your book, King of Cheer. It is available now. I'm, I'll am i say it again. This, is, this should be the number one Christmas gift for sports fans because I think the yeah. stories in here are going to be incredible. I can't wait to read it. Uh, Cam, I really appreciate you giving us some yeah. time today. This was a ton of fun, man. Your energy comes through on the podcast. I want to do another two <laughs> oh. hours of this podcast. Oh, yeah, you got yeah. me jazz. I just <laughs> want to say uh, on like, and, and maybe I can't speak on behalf of Oilers fans, but as an Oilers fan who has wit- witnessed you and the energy you bring, thank you. Thank you for getting us up from our coma when we're watching the hockey game and remembering what it is to be a fan. Like, thank you. You're doing a great job at this. Well, you know, I always, I appreciate that a lot. I always say, like, if it's not me, I hope it's someone else, you know, because I, 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 I think fans, they love their team, they're spending good money, and I, you want to see people have a great time. And, I, you know, since this whole pandemic, I've made a list of the teams, that, you know, I would love one more night at Rogers Place, you know, one more night. We we look forward to that happening, Cam. Appreciate your time today. Yeah. Can't wait to see you. Cheers. See you, Cam. Thanks. All right. There you go. That's Cameron Hughes. Uh, <laughs> this guy. He's just, wow. He, uh, he I, left us with a story that makes you guys have to buy the book. Yeah. Yep. He let us in a little bit. Wow. Unfortunately, awesome. we had to edit that out, or it wasn't while we were recording, but uh, buy the book for this story. And you'll and when you read the book, you'll go, that's the story he told the guys off the air. Yeah. Fuck, that's and that, that makes so much sense. Uh, it, it was perfect. It was great. Yeah, yeah. Fuck that guy had me. He, that, that guy just exudes energy. Eh? Like he answers the phone and, and he's just like all of a sudden in it. Like he, yeah. like the guy just like, holy cow, he's good. I that can see good. why he does what he does. And, and if you don't know, if you're listening to this right now and you don't know who Cameron Hughes is, I'm I'm telling you, go to CameronHughes.tv and just play around on his website. There's great stories in here. Like I've been reading – that's off the entire podcast. There's a lot of great shit in here that we didn't even get to cover. Yeah. Like he's been to the Olympics twice, mm-hmm. you know, the cup finals, the NBA finals, U S open. He goes to the just for laughs festival in Montreal every year. Great cup. Katie Curry. So you name it. He's there. Yeah. It's, it's really impressive. Like I love, we've talked about it a couple times just in past podcasts. I love unique and weird career paths. Mm-hmm. And this is this is one of the best ones I've ever heard. Well, never mind like getting your dream job. He basically created his dream career. Like the, I know yeah. Crazy George and all that. Like it exists to an extent, but like no one's ever done it the way Cameron Hughes did it. And I think that's so cool to just go out there and, and a bit like an element of you know maybe flukiness to it as well. Just starting to cheer one night in his hometown, watching a Senators game, and having them be like, 
you know what? Fuck it. Keep doing it. Bring it back. Let's go. It's great. Just great. Oh, uh, you know what I forgot to ask him that I, we definitely need to get him back on is I guarantee he has got some airport hacks that nobody knows. Oh, for sure. Cause <laughs> yeah, that guy travels like a mofo and he's probably got the, the highest status there is. Uh, it was with airlines. Every Absolutely. airport security knows him by name. He just cruises right through. Um, all right. So I never thought I would say this. We have to thank the Ottawa senators for actually doing the right thing. Yeah. And wow. Bringing this guy in and giving him a platform. Yeah. hundred percent. Wow. Um, and if you're listening to this and you look up who Cameron Hughes is and you go, Oh, that guy, I honestly just thought he was an Oilers fan. Well, you're not alone. I think that's kind of part of the allure of it, right? Is when you just see him for the first, first time or two, cause you mentioned after a while you start to pick up on what's going on. But the first time or two, you're kind of like, Oh man, this guy's just fucking wild. This is hilarious. Yeah. But then, but then you find out he's a pro and you're like, Holy shit. Like good on this guy. Yeah. Like, yep. He's a pro at this? Like, you could do that? He also, like, he, I, da- he dances up and down the stairs so well. And, like, the stairs at Rogers, especially in the upper bowl, are pretty see? steep. I forgot to ask him, has he ever, like, tripped? Like, has he ever He's fallen? A tumble. Yeah. That'd be fun. Well, and it's, yeah. like, it's so steep and you're so high. Like, it, it kind of fucks with your brain. Yeah. You get a little bit of vertigo, too. Like, the fact he just kind of keeps it on the rails, unlike this podcast, it's impressive. Yeah, that was super cool. How he does that. And uh, I remember the first time I saw him. And I remember thinking, it was like Jay said, where I thought he was an Oilers fan. And then he did the thing where he pulls off all the shirts and he's throwing them into the crowd and he's swinging them over his head. And I, was, I remember thinking, I was like, wow, OEG finally hired a guy to get the building going. <laughs> little, did, little did I know that he does it everywhere, which is yeah. amazing. Incredible. And he, and he talked about something we need to do is to set up a section of fans to start setting the tone. Yep. And, there, and our mission is to set up the nation section at Rogers Place. And I don't really care. I'm going to be public about this. We were so close to getting it done. Very the close. It was supposed to happen. We had a date and they pulled the rug out from under us and we want to make the nation section a thing. So if anyone's from the others listening, let's, let's get that conversation going. Cause when fans come back and are able to come back in the building, just like Cam said, we're going to be more engaged than ever. So we can do this. Capitalize but I also on like it. that. I also like that he acknowledged it. it's a two-way street, right? Like mm-hmm. I like the idea of, and again, he mentioned it, you, you got to pay the bills. Everybody's got a mortgage to pay. I get all that. But like tighten up those promo pieces and get more stuff for the fans going. But like Jay said, fans also got to be willing to participate and get that done. So, yeah. And he was honest about it too. Like he talked about, you know, like that's everywhere in Canada. Fans know so much. And to an extent, I and I'll use this word, I don't want it to be harsh, but you're hockey snobs, right? Like, you know how the game is supposed to go. You know exactly yeah, when to cheer. Whereas when we go to Vegas, like, it's a three-on-two rush that in Edmonton, you wouldn't even, you'd be like, okay, here we go. But in Vegas, a three-on-two rush is like, oh, and everyone's clapping and cheering and there's like a roar. And it's like, it's almost a blessing that maybe their their hockey culture hasn't hit the point that ours has, right? Where like, if you're just willing to cheer for everything, and maybe that's a mindset Oilers fans need to flip on a little bit. And I know I'm guilty of it as well. Like, Flip the switch a little. Just cheer for everything. Well, I do like also that uh, Cameron acknowledged that in Vegas, you've got the yeah. green light to be silly on a Tuesday night if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, a good permission point. to be crazy. Yeah. Um, all right. I like how we... Episode 231 Real Life Podcast. Once again, it is brought to you by Oodle Noodle. 14 locations in Edmonton. 15 is coming. Heads up, Fort Saskatchewan. They're coming for you. Wani's recommendation this week. The butter chicken. He loves it. Uh, also, our friends at Twig and Berries. Christmas is coming. So, I mean, like, we basically do your Christmas shopping for you. Harner Ryan mm-hmm. Singh has a great book out. We just heard about Cameron Hughes' great book. There's two books you could get for a hockey fan. And then yep. go pick up the apparel from Twig and Berries, and you're good to go. Promo code NATION15 gets you 15% off your order. They also have a special, like, gift box right now, Twig and Berries. 150 bucks gets you a whole list of products in there at once. Great stuff from our friends at T&B's. Tyler, you'd like to, I think that you'd like to know that I'm wearing my nutsack undies right now. I was and hoping you would tell me that. I feel like I'm being That's wrapped. getting a little weird. I feel like I'm being wrapped in a cuddle. Nice. My undercarriage is well taken care of. Thank you, Quick and Berries. And uh, on that note, we wrap up the podcast. Shout out to Cameron Hughes for giving us some time today. That guy was <laughs> tremendous. He was full of energy. Uh, when, when next time he's in Edmonton, pandemic's over, we're back in the studio. I think I think maybe an in-person chat with Cameron Hughes is due because that'd be a ton of fun. Uh, shout out to Oodle Noodle. Shout out to Twig and Berries. Wanye as well. Bag Milk, Jay. I'm Tyler Uremchuk. 
Thanks for downloading episode 231. King of Cheer. King of Cheer. Bye, King of Cheer. And that's how we end the podcast. Talk to you on Thursday. Great job on making it through the entire hour of the Real Life Podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from.